Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the third meeting of the Digital Europe Economic Seminars. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Heidi van der Bosch of the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Antwerp. Uh, Professor van der Bosch is a member of the Media and ICT in Organizations and Society Research Group and has been studying issues uh, related to cyberbullying since 2005. Uh, has led several research projects on the topic and published uh, in high-ranked high rank journals. Um, I have to say I'm very interested in learning more, uh, both as a curious researcher and as a concerned father of two future internet users, mm -hmm. uh, whose room I'm currently occupying. <sighs> and so thank you very much for agreeing to talk uh, about cyberbullying research. And thank you everyone for coming. We're going to have approximately 40 minutes uh, for the presentation, approximately, and then followed by some time for questions. Uh, so thank you again, and Professor van der Bosch, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for having me here to uh, present at this uh, seminar. Um, I will try to share my slides now. Okay, I hope you can all see them. Um, so yes, um, as uh, mentioned before, I am member of the Department of Communication Studies um, at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And in our research group, we have actually been uh, conducting research on cyberbullying since uh, 2005. So um, we actually started with uh, studies that really looked um, at the prevalence of uh, cyberbullying. So is it a very common problem or not? Uh, we also looked at the young people who were involved as a perpetrator or as bystander or as a victim. And we also looked at the impact of cyberbullying. So uh, what does it has as an, an effect on especially the victims, but perhaps also on uh, bystanders, those who witness the cyberbullying. So we started with that type of actually problem-focused research. And then throughout time, we actually also evolved towards more uh, solution-based uh, research. Um, and I will give some examples later on, but we especially looked at uh, technological tools that could be used to prevent or to detect or actually also to intervene in cyberbullying instances. So what I will try to present today is actually uh, the whole range of research that we did. And I will indeed move from problem to solutions. And so this is quite general uh, and broad overview. But of course, if you have more detailed uh, questions, you can always uh, raise your hand afterwards and, and ask the questions. And of course, I will try to answer them as uh, good as possible. Um, okay. Um, so um, perhaps we should start with uh, giving a kind of uh, definition of uh, cyberbullying. And this perhaps might seem very evident or very easy to do if we uh, think about cyberbullying. I think that most of us really think about indeed uh, hurtful behavior. Uh, so uh, you see something that is happening online and online then uh, could mean that you see it on TikTok or it's a message on WhatsApp or you see it happening on Snapchat, on Instagram, Facebook, et, et cetera. So, um, Hurtful behavior that is happening online, that seems to be the core of uh, cyberbullying. And if we then think about concrete instances or concrete behaviors that uh, might be associated with uh, cyberbullying, we can think of examples like, okay, somebody is insulting someone else or somebody is threatening uh, somebody else, or perhaps someone is creating a hate page or uh, distributing uh, embarrassing pictures or videos of uh, somebody else. So this is perhaps what comes to mind automatically when we think about cyberbullying. And also if you look at, uh, for instance, how news media talk about cyberbullying, these seem to be the main characteristics. 
However, if you then try to see what you could consider as cyberbullying in very concrete instances, you will notice that it is actually very difficult to say whether something constitutes uh, cyberbullying or not. And I will try to give a few examples and perhaps you could then think about whether you should or could consider this a cyberbullying or not. So this is a first example. So what you see here is um, actually um, a picture of a class that is being posted on a social networking site. And uh, you see all the students here and you see that one of the students is actually in black and wild, white while the other students are in full color. And um, this is, for instance, a picture that is being posted at the end of the school year. And uh, someone is saying, uh, okay, I'm gonna miss you so much. And then uh, you can see in the comments or in the guiding text that it mentions, uh, this is our perfect class without, and then the name of that one student that you can see in black and white, the liar, the negative, dumb, stupid bitch whom we all hate. And then class, and then the name of the class without, and then the name of the girl, love you. And imagine indeed that uh, some of the bystanders are actually uh, liking this post and perhaps also commenting um, on uh, what has been posted by this person. I think that many people would say that this is indeed cyberbullying because one person is actually indeed being uh, yeah, insulted uh, uh, on uh, uh, for instance, a social networking site, and uh, there is a clear audience that also seems to reinforce uh, the person who uh, posted this, uh, this message. So that perhaps might be a very clear uh, uh, case of uh, cyberbullying. Uh, in some instances, it might be more difficult to say whether something that is happening online is indeed cyberbullying or not. So imagine this is a post of a young girl. Uh, she is a member of a scouts group. And actually the scouts group is um, organizing a party and she mentions everyone should come. And you can see that many people actually liked this post, but there is someone who is writing, not if you are going, sorry. So here you could perhaps already doubt how about yeah, what is actually the intention of this specific message? Is this meant to be hurtful or not? And if so, is it really a case of cyberbullying or not? And here I think that you already notice that it is not always easy to judge a situation if you are an online bystander. And perhaps you need more information, for instance, what is the relationship between the person who posted this on this uh, uh, as a reaction on this post? Uh, are these friends? And is this just a joke? Or is this indeed an act of aggression? So here, perhaps already some more doubts. And especially on social networking sites, of course, we don't only see interactions between people we, whom we know very well. We also see interactions between strangers and we are not always uh, sure about how they are related to each other. So you already see that sometimes you need more information, more contextual information to actually judge a situation. Okay, some more examples. Um, this uh, might perhaps look like a very positive post. Um, you see uh, a picture of a group of friends, uh, girls at the seaside, and this seems to be a very uh, positive post. Uh, so I think most of you would think, well, why uh, could this be an example of cyberbullying? Well, let's... Uh, uh, imagine that you are uh, a person who is always being excluded from this group of girls 
and that you don't only encounter that exclusion uh, offline, for instance, in the school context, but that they also make sure that you actually feel that you are not included, that you are not part of their group by posting this on social media. So in that case, even this could constitute a form of cyberbullying. You're being excluded and perhaps it's really intended to also hurt you because they know, for instance, that you will also see this picture on your uh, social media account. And then there are some other examples. Um, this is an interaction between um, two very young uh, children. Uh, they are 12 years old. And this is, I think, uh, a post on uh, Instagram in stories. And this is what you also typically see that, uh, for instance, young uh, people, uh, young children actually ask their friends to answer a few of uh, the questions. And here you can see a boy that answered the questions, but actually he always picked the negative answer. So uh, this girl, of course, was hoping to get some positive answers, but he's actually saying all the neg negative things. So if you call me at 3 p.m. and he indicated I wouldn't answer it, or if uh, you would kiss me and he answered, I would ask why and I would push you away. Or if you would like to meet me, he answered, uh, oh no. So here you can see that, yeah, this is also an interaction. And here again, you can wonder, what is this actually? Is this just a joke? Or is this uh, just a, a conflict? Or is this really cyberbullying? And then the very last example, uh, this is, uh, um, an account that was actually created and it was related to a school and the title of the account was memes and then you got the name of the school and you can already see here that um, they posted uh, nine messages and that there were 144 followers so likely students from this school and actually the goal of this account was to post memes of other pupils in school um, and to comment on them. And actually, uh, the account says that it was not meant to hurt. So it is meant as a joke. But you can also see that this is a private account. So it means that they're trying to hide something for the bigger audience and that you indeed have to be allowed to do, uh, be a follower of this account. So here again, there's the question, okay, uh, they say it's intended to just be for fun, but actually what they're posting is perhaps also hurting uh, the people who are actually, uh, yeah, uh, taking pictures of and who are actually being laughed at at this account. So just a few examples, I think, to actually demonstrate that it might seem very obvious to say what is cyberbullying and to think about examples. But in very concrete instances, you see that it is not so easy to judge situations and that it is very important actually to take into account uh, the context. So uh, we should actually know what is the intention. Is it indeed meant to hurt or is it just uh, a normal post and is it actually a joke, for instance? Um, we should also know more about the persons involved. Is this just a conflict between two friends? Or is this a joke between two friends? Or is this indeed a situation where, for instance, a very popular um, pupil from school is saying something negative about a less popular or an isolated uh, student in school? So then there is a kind of power imbalance. And then the third aspect that is also often taken into account is, is this just a one case incident or is this a kind of uh, an element or uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pattern actually? Is, this, is there a kind of repetition? Is this not just a single act? So these three criteria are actually often used to um, 
actually say whether or define whether something is bullying or not. And these three criteria are also used, um, albeit in a different uh, sentence sometimes or meaning sometimes in the context of cyberbullying. So this to make clear that actually defining cyberbullying is not that easy. And you will see also in the literature, and I mentioned uh, a very uh, recent um, uh, article uh, here below, even in the recent literature, this is still an issue. How should we define cyberbullying and how should we also measure this phenomena? Okay, um, so that is something that is uh, also uh, something that we noticed actually in one of the first studies that we conducted in uh, 2008. So uh, we, uh, in this case, uh, talked about uh, or talked with young people um, in uh, several focus groups. And there too, we mentioned that young people indeed often make very uh, distinctive judgments about situations. So they really uh, consider cyberbullying as something very different from conflicts or from jokes. And indeed, they also refer to the three criteria that I mentioned. Okay, so that's about um, how to uh, define cyberbullying. Um, we can also look now at a few statements. And perhaps this is a kind of test for all of you to also see uh, what your perceptions are about uh, cyberbullying, and then to look at what the existing uh, evidence, uh, the existing research says about uh, this statement. Um, I uh, posted uh, a newspaper uh, article here, uh, and it's a newspaper article in, in Dutch, and it uh, mentions that uh, bullying behavior is very prevalent um, at TikTok, of course, uh, a platform that we know very well right now because it is very popular amongst young people. And this newspaper article is not that uh, isolated, I think, Oftentimes, when we look at news media, they will state that uh, cyberbullying is very prevalent, that it is a kind of plague um, and uh, or a kind of epidemic even. Uh, and they also seem to suggest that it is more common than traditional bullying. And that was actually also one of the uh, hypothesis we actually started from in uh, the first studies we did. And uh, we thought perhaps cyberbullying is indeed more prevalent than traditional bullying, because of course young people are online um, uh, most of the time, but especially also because ICT um, might facilitate this type of aggressive behave behavior because uh, you can uh, act sometimes anonymously. And also, if you're sitting behind your screen, behind your laptop or behind your uh, smartphone, well, that might, might make it very easy actually to say something rude or to insult somebody uh, because you can't really see the impact on the victim uh, because the victim, of course, can't uh, react directly. Um, so these might actually be some facilitating or disinhibiting um, uh, factors. Well, if we look at the findings of the uh, studies, we actually see that uh, this statement is, is false. Uh, so uh, cyberbullying is certainly not an epidemic, but on the other hand, it is not a rarity too. So. It is a quite common problem, but it is still less common than, for instance, uh, traditional bullying. And that is a finding that you see in, uh, in a lot of uh, studies that make the comparison between prevalence rates of traditional and uh, cyberbullying. Um, another um, kind of statement or hypothesis we had in the first studies was uh, that cyberbullying would, of course, uh, 
or would perhaps be more prevalent amongst uh, adolescents than amongst younger children, so primary school children, for instance. And the reason to have this hypothesis was, of course, that adolescence is more related to uh, yeah, peer groups and peer contexts that are also being maintained online. So uh, adolescents oftentimes use their smartphone or use uh, other online tools to keep in touch with uh, their peers. And because they are online for social reasons and also because, of course, um, yeah, uh, peer issues are very important during this phase. We actually expected that uh, cyberbullying would be more common amongst them. And in our studies, we indeed also found that kind of pattern. So if we uh, studied uh, cyberbullying, we oftentimes found that there was a kind of peak age uh, or a peak in cyberbullying around the age uh, between 12 and 15 years old. But also, yeah, people or pupils from about 12 year olds, for instance, as you can see here in the first graph, um, were already involved also as victims. But this is also a quite common uh, finding in the literature that especially young adolescents are involved in uh, cyberbullying because they're oftentimes online and because peers, peer relationships are so important, especially during adolescence. So this is, or this was actually true, but of course you can also uh, wonder whether that might be changing. And I think one of the reasons to believe it might have or has changed already is uh, because young people, even younger people, are getting smartphones, for instance, from a younger age. And even younger children are online nowadays, for instance, on platforms such as uh, TikTok. So, um, yeah, because the possession of, yeah, the devices um, is, is, yeah, the, or the age is decreasing. Uh, this could also mean that, um, yeah, these young children have access to online communication. And this might also mean that also in their case, they might be bullying others, not only in the school context, for instance, but also online. Then a third uh, statement here is um, the statement uh, whether cyber bullies uh, differ from uh, traditional bullies. Um, this was also a very uh, important hypothesis in the early research on cyberbullying, because uh, we often thought as researchers that these technologies could also actually empower those that were not that powerful in an offline context. Uh, for instance, girls are uh, actually the, the victims of traditional bullying. Um, are they feeling empowered now through technologies to engage in this behavior themselves? And in the case of uh, traditional uh, victim bullies, we uh, call this hypothesis also the revenge of the nerds. So if you're being attacked, for instance, in a school context, um, because you are a nerd and because you don't have physical power, um, does then ICT allow you to take revenge online? So can you bully your offline perpetrators, for instance? Um, here you can see that actually uh, the answer to this statement is that it is mostly false. So when we look at the research, we often see that uh, people keep their roles. So um, if you are an offline perpetrator, you're also more likely to be an online perpetrator. And if you are an offline victim, you're also more likely to be an online victim. So you don't switch roles, um, but actually oftentimes online bullying is an extension of traditional bullying. Um, what you can see here in uh, these two uh, pictures actually um, are, um, 
the networks that we created based on a kind of nomination survey that we did in a, a Flemish school. Um, so what you can see here is actually the result of uh, a questionnaire that each of these uh, students filled out. And we asked them to nominate uh, the pupils from their school uh, with whom they were befriended. So uh, they really got a list of names and then they had to indicate, okay, he or she is a friend of mine. So what you can see here in these two graphs are actually the friendship networks in this school. Uh, so all the friendship relationships uh, between uh, adolescents that were in the second year of secondary uh, education. So um, what does it mean? So every, um, every square you could say is actually a, a pupil and all the lines indicate that there is a friendship relationship between two students. So if I say you are my friend and you say uh, that I'm your friend, this is actually a line in this graph. So you can already see now that there are a few pupils uh, here on the left side that are actually uh, not in the friendship network. So these are actually some kind of isolated students. They were not recognized or um, nominated as a friend by other pupils. Um, what you can also see here is their involvement in traditional bullying. So um, you can see that some of the squares are in gray. So these are then actually um, the ones that indicated that they have been bullied, uh, while uh, the ones in black actually uh, indicated that they were perpetrators. And you can also see that there are some students who actually were both the victim and the perpetrator of traditional bullying. So what you can see here on this graph on the left side is that uh, many of these isolated students who don't have any friends are oftentimes traditional victims. And on the other hand, you will see that traditional bullying is actually quite common uh, in this year. You see uh, quite a lot of uh, students who indicated they were victimized or that they were indeed perpetrators. And you also see some cliques, some groups of perpetrators. So uh, there are groups indeed of, of bullies in this uh, school. On the right hand, you see actually the same network. So it's the same uh, friendship network, but here in this case, you see uh, those students um, who indicated that they were involved in cyberbullying. So again, the dark color, uh, the black indicates that they were perpetrator and the gray indicated that they were the victim. And if you just compare these two uh, graphs, you will already see, of course, that indeed cyberbullying is much less common than traditional bullying is. But if you would put these two graphs or these two networks on each other, you would indeed see that they overlap to a certain extent. So that victims of traditional bullying indeed also have a higher chance of becoming victims of online bullying and the same holds for uh, perpetrators. So you actually see that the two phenomena, uh, traditional bullying and cyberbullying, actually have a lot of common and that they often build on each other. And then the last aspect, which is related to the yeah, exploration actually of uh, cyberbullying as a problem is uh, the question about the impact of cyberbullying. And here again, we had the question, well, is cyberbullying worse perhaps than um, traditional bullying? Because indeed it can happen to you anywhere and anytime. So you're not safe anymore, nowhere and never. And also if you are being cyberbullied, the audience that could see that or could notice that could be a very wide or even a worldwide audience. So. Uh, your uh, yeah, reputation, let's say, 
could be damaged, not only in a school context, but actually everyone could see it online. Uh, and a third element that might also contribute to the impact of cyberbullying is that in this case, even worse than in the situation of traditional bullying, you could feel powerless because sometimes you don't even know who is bullying you because somebody is, for instance, using a fake account. And also, if something is put um, online, it is not always easy to uh, get that message or that post away. You can't always delete that content. And also, it often multiplicates or is multiplied. Uh, so it's really difficult to get control and to, uh, yeah, to, to take away actually the message that is hurting you. So this was also a, a hypothesis and actually here the answer is that it is true that cyberbullying on average is uh, or has a more negative impact uh, than traditional bullying. You can see this here uh, in this uh, graph. This is a graph from a study from Campbell, uh, Spears, Lee and Butler, uh, colleagues from Australia. And here you can see how they uh, looked at um, the scores for mental health problems amongst different types of uh, victims. So you uh, can see that there were cyber victims only, but also traditional victims only and combined victims. So those people are being harassed or bullied online and offline. And what you can actually see is that those who experience bullying both offline and online um, they experience the most negative impact. But if you just look at those victims who are being bullied either online or either offline, then you can see that cyber victims actually score worse than uh, traditional victims. One important uh, um, thing here uh, is, of course, that also a lot of uh, the impact depends on the type of cyberbullying. What you can see here on the right side is actually uh, material that we used in an experiment that we did, where we looked at um, how uh, bystanders would react to certain uh, situations that represent cyberbullying. And this is the material that we used. So this is a post in this case, it was on Facebook, but it's using a picture and it's in front of a large audience. So somebody is being humili humiliated in front of the large audience. And this is actually a kind of private message that is being sent to someone. And here you can see, of course, that the type of cyberbullying, of course, also uh, determines its impact. So if you're being cyberbullying, for before a large audience with pictures or videos, well, that kind of cyberbullying has much more serious consequences than cyberbullying that takes place through uh, private messages. Okay, so thus far, I think a situation uh, or uh, an overview of the, the problem itself, then we can also look at yeah, how can we deal with this problem? Uh, who should be involved and what could these different parties do? Um, I made this uh, figure to indicate that actually uh, uh, cyberbullying and tackling cyberbullying requires efforts from a lot of uh, people and a lot of stakeholders. You can see that young people themselves, of course, can uh, do things to prevent or to detect or to stop the problem. But there are also other parties involved like parents, schools, uh, the ICT industry, so the platforms themselves. And of course, also the police or health professionals can do something about uh, cyberbullying. Um, I will now have a look at all these uh, different parties and we'll focus on uh, what they could do. And of course, when we look at young people, we can, uh, first of all, also uh, look at those young people who have been victimized or perhaps have the risk of being victimized. And here we could say that 
what we should learn them uh, is to better protect themselves online because we see that indeed online uh, risky behavior, um, sharing your password, for instance, or putting up personal information online, indeed increases the chances of being uh, cyber bullied. Um, so we could teach them uh, this, uh, even though, um, yeah, it is not a, a yeah, a 100% proof that you cannot be cyberbullied anymore. Of course, even although you can protect yourself to some degree, you cannot really avoid that you become a victim. If, if they're putting up a, a, an online hate website, yeah, there's nothing you could have done to prevent that. Um, so even if it does happen, then we can also teach uh, victims how to cope with this. And um, I think that is also very important because we often see from our studies too that young people do not always react in the right way. For instance, they often retaliate, so uh, they are being cyber bullied and they're bullying back. Uh, or what they also often don't do is uh, they don't dare to talk uh, to their parents or to their friends. Uh, for instance, because they are feeling ashamed of uh, what has happened uh, to them. So this is something that we should certainly pay attention to. And you can also see that a lot of uh, the current uh, initiatives uh, indeed also focus on uh, victims and how to support them. Uh, for instance, if you go and have a look at platforms like Facebook or Instagram, you will indeed see that nowadays these platforms have a lot of tools that help victim, victims or, or users in general to uh, protect their account, to make sure that not everyone can uh, see their posts. They can also block persons they don't like, etc. So uh, a lot of these tools already help to empower uh, users. You can also see other tools. Um, for instance, here, uh, this is a kind of online buddy um, that can be used to support victims. So in this case, it could be, for instance, an, an app on your smartphone uh, that is available whenever you're uh, being uh, cyberbullied and that gives you uh, perhaps some uh, feedback, provides you with uh, emotional support, but could also give you some concrete advice about how to deal with uh, the situation. Here on the right side, you often see also see a program that was developed by uh, colleagues from the Netherlands. They created a kind of website that was uh, aimed at uh, the victims of um, online bullying and where they too could uh, actually learn how to cope with situations. And then here, really um, at the bottom on the right side, you can also see an example of an online helpline. In this case, it's the Flemish helpline Awel. Um, and I think that there are a lot of uh, uh, similar helplines in uh, other countries. But here, uh, for instance, uh, young people can ask a lot of questions or tell their story and then get support from professionals, but also from other internet users. And you see that bullying is actually a topic that is discussed a lot on these help uh, forums or helplines. So this is what uh, Yes, victims or how victims can be helped and supported. Um, of course, we can also aim our efforts at the perpetrators. Um, and what is important then is that we learn perpetrators how to deal with negative emotions. And this is important because um, our research also uh, indicates that, especially in the case of young people, but also in the case of adults, actually, uh, a lot of negative emotions actually incite the cyberbullying behavior. So especially young people who are feeling angry have a higher uh, chance of yeah, actually becoming a perpetrator. Um, this is what you also see here. Uh, we did a, a study a few years ago um, and we uh, investigated the relationship 
between sleep quality, between experience of anger, and between cyberbullying perpetration. And in this study, for instance, we noticed indeed that young people who actually uh, don't sleep well during the night, and this was also related to their ICT use, because oftentimes smartphones also keep us awake or they disturb us during our sleep. So if you have a bad sleep quality, this makes you feel worse during the day and makes you also feel uh, more angry during the day. And we also noticed then that students who felt more angry uh, also had a higher chance of indeed becoming involved in cyberbullying perpetration. So yeah, knowing um, how to deal with negative emotions is especially something that we should uh, teach to teach uh, the potential perpetrators or young people in general. We should of course also uh, learn them that cyberbullying is not accepted because apart from emotions, we also see that there are some uh, attitudes and uh, perceived norms that influence perpetrators' um, uh, uh, yeah, behavior. So uh, a lot of young people also think that it is normal to cyberbully or they think that it might actually have some benefits if you cyberbullying someone else. So this is also something I believe that we should counter in our interventions. And of course, they should also be learned how to empathize with victims. So uh, that's, of course, something that I already mentioned at the beginning. Because there is a device between us, we can't always see the reactions of the victim. It's not that easy to emphasize, to, to really imagine what they're going through. And that is something that we could also teach uh, them. So there are a lot of things that we could also tell uh, the perpetrators. Here you can also see some uh, of the initiatives that actually focus on that. Um, perhaps I can focus on uh, this one on the left side. This is actually uh, what you can nowadays also see on uh, Instagram where you um, actually get a kind of uh, message uh, that makes you reflect before you post a message. So uh, here you see, are you sure you want to post this? So this is actually a way to encourage reflection, to actually uh, make sure that people don't react too impulsively. And this was something that we also had been testing before, even before Instagram had this as a, as a feature. Uh, we tested this in, uh, in an experimental context. Uh, and this was on the right side, the example that we used was a kind of scenario where uh, students were confronted with a certain, certain situation and where they actually had to indicate indicate whether uh, they were planning to uh, engage in what we call slut shaming. So calling a young girl a slut or a whore. Uh, and if that was the case, if there was a chance that they would post such a comment, we actually confronted them with a, a similar type of pop-up message. And we uh, uh, tested several kinds of these pop-up messages. Uh, sometimes we mentioned that their parents could see this post, or sometimes we mentioned that uh, the bystanders would disapprove of this, or we also mentioned that the message could um, be uh, damageful to, to the uh, victim. Uh, and sometimes we just ask them to reflect twice without giving a certain message. And we actually saw that if you indeed um, create reflection, make young people think twice, they will be less likely to engage in this type of behavior. Um, so yeah, this also indicates indeed that impulsive re reactions are very common and that we should try to break that impulsivity. And so these are tools aimed at um, perpetrators, but of course we can also look at the bystanders. 
So these are the people who witness what is happening between the perpetrator and between the victim. And this is actually a very large group. But this group can also play a very important role because we also know that if uh, bystanders don't react or if they uh, actually uh, bully uh, together with the bully or the original bully, they of course make the situation very worse. Uh, on the other hand, if they show that they don't agree, if they support the victim, this also has very beneficial outcomes. So actually the group of bystanders is very important to, uh, to, to target in interventions. Uh, this is what we also did. Um, I see I don't have that much time anymore, but uh, uh, we also did a lot of research on bystanders' behaviors, and as you can see here, actually the group that does nothing is actually very large. So many people see a lot of things happening online, but they don't react, and actually that is not good because that silently reinforces the bully. The bully will think, okay, if they don't react, they actually agree. And of course, if they don't react, this also signals to the victim that yeah, nobody actually chooses their side. So uh, it is very important then to try to change that, to promote positive bystandership so that bystanders really show their disapproval of the situation and are really also going to help the victim. Um, I will skip the next slide because they will show more of that research on why people are not reacting, for instance. But this is then also a tool that tries to change that. So building on our research on bystanders, we uh, then created a game, a game that was also intended to, um, or also tried to promote positive bystandership. So here you can see, uh, the game with uh, here the various situations that uh, pupils could encounter in the game and actually they had to choose how they would react to a case of cyberbullying and here again there were also some good answers and some wrong answers so not doing anything or bullying back was considered a, a wrong answer while showing your support to the victim or just uh, showing your disapproval to the cyberbullying was regarded as a, a good reaction. And we also indeed saw that if you do this, if you use a game to train positive bystandership, that it indeed has an impact on how people, how pupils re will react later also in the real life. So these are some tools um, that are aimed at uh, the bystanders. And there are also some other examples. Uh, for instance, here on the right side, you can see that even bots, so bots on Twitter, for instance, so not real people, but bots can be used to show their uh, their that they, they don't agree, for instance, with racist posts that are being uh, posted, and that if the post, uh, if the, uh, sorry, if the bot, um, yeah, seems to be a person that is from your in-group, and if it seems to be someone who is popular, you will see that that uh, perpetrators will be less uh, encouraged to do the similar behavior in, uh, in the future. So this was an example in the uh, US context. So here you could see the bot with a profile picture actually uh, describing a black or a white person. And then, so that was a ma manipulation of, does the person belong to your own group, the in-group or to the out-group? And then what they also manipulated in this study was how popular this person is. So how many followers does this person who is actually the, the bot have? So uh, if the person who reacts is very popular and, is, and, and he or she is from the in-group, then uh, yeah, this bystander reaction is actually most effective. 
Um, I don't know if I still have time. Otherwise, I will skip a few slides and go to uh, the end of the presentation. I don't know if I still have time. Uh, I mean, it's, it's perfectly fine for me if you continue. Uh, perhaps uh, we could ask if there are any questions for now. Would that be okay? That's Yeah, that's okay for me. So, uh, are there any questions for, 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 for what's been already presented or should we just continue? Don't hesitate to write on the chat or just uh, unmute yourself and ask. I, I think we can continue. Okay, but I will try to keep it quite short, but uh, yeah, I would like to focus on a few other actors, and those are the parents, and I think they also play a very important role in the case of, of cyberbullying, because a lot of cyberbullying actually takes place not within the school text or within the school hours, but actually from home, for instance. And we also see in research that uh, students who have parents who are involved, also involved in their ICT use, actually have a lower chance of becoming a perpetrator. So that underlines the role that parents can play. And here too, we should try to guide these parents and teach them a few things. For instance, how uh, indeed, how they should mediate their children's ICT use, but also how they can model the right online behavior themselves. Because of course, parents, uh, don't only have an influence by directly intervening in the ICT use of their children, but also how they behave, they behave themselves online is very important. People, our, our pupils really learn from that. Um, I, I think it's also important indeed to uh, teach parents what kind of signs they should in, take into account because, um, yeah, uh, children are not always inclined to tell their parents that they are being cyberbullied. So, yeah, and it's all, all also not always clear because, yeah, students, uh, young people often have their own communication channels and you don't always know what they're doing online. So then you really have to be attentive uh, for yeah, possible signs of, of uh, cyberbullying involvement. And then, and that's also something that uh, is important to teach parents, they should also uh, be taught how to react in case their um, child is involved um, as a victim or as a bystander or as a cyber bully. Um, and here too, we often see that parents nowadays don't always react in the right way. Uh, for instance, uh, if parents notice that their child is being victimized online, they often react very emotionally. So they are very angry, for instance, or they are very sad. And they actually don't or are, are not really able to control their own uh, feelings. And the way they react is actually also too impulsively. So we should help uh, and guide parents to re react in an appropriate way. Um, and that also entails that we also teach parents that once they, their child is uh, being victimized, for instance, that they should try to find a solution together with the child. Because sometimes parents want to take control and try to solve the situation themselves, but this also sends the wrong message to their child because it actually emphasizes the idea that they are powerless and that they can do, can't do anything about the situation, while we should try to encourage them to think about uh, possible solutions and also act on, it, on them themselves. Uh, and what is also important, of course, as uh, a parent is that, okay, if your child uh, tells you it has been victimized and if you have thought about a plan to uh, deal with it, that you should also, of course, follow up the situation. So uh, is the situation becoming better or even worse? And is it time to think about other uh, possibilities to deal with the pr problem or, or not? 
So parents are also a very important group uh, to target in interventions. Uh, you can also see that some companies indeed have also created technological tools that uh, support parents in actually monitoring the online behavior of their children. Uh, but there are also uh, websites, for instance, with advice aimed uh, at parents. Uh, these are, for instance, the stories that we created uh, that actually provided advice also to parents. Um, so through narratives, through realistic stories, we really uh, yeah, try to reach parents and also uh, teach them how to react uh, uh, in circum, uh, circumstances. Then, of course, schools are also important uh, in cyberbullying interventions because cyberbullying is often an extension of traditional bullying, and that traditional bullying is often also related to the school context. So it is the origin, oftentimes, of online bullying, but it's also the place where the impact is uh, felt. Uh, so that's why schools should also be uh, involved in uh, trying to tackle uh, cyberbullying. And here too, there is already a lot of research on uh, the effectiveness also of uh, school programs uh, that aim to prevent and tackle uh, cyberbullying. Uh, and here, what is very important here is, I think that it is integrated in a whole school approach. A whole school approach means that different types of actors are involved. So it includes students and teachers and parents. Um, and it also means that you uh, focus on different things. So on the prevention of bullying, but also on the detection and also on the solution of uh, bullying and cyberbullying incidents. So it's a very broad approach and it is usually a program. So not just a one-time initiative, it's, it's, it often involves uh, teaching in the classroom. It often involves creating a kind of uh, bullying intervention uh, team in a school context, etc. So here too, uh, uh, it's important to look at how schools can be involved. And we also noticed from our research that a lot of schools um, are actually, actually willing to take responsibility. So they really also have the feeling that cyberbullying is a problem that they should deal with. But what is oftentimes lacking is yeah, the expertise of how to deal with it. Uh, and that was also clear from a study that we did amongst uh, teachers in secondary schools, where we asked them how they dealt with uh, cyberbullying incidents themselves. And many of them actually said, I will refer the student to someone else. And here again, that is not the solution, of course. Uh, if, if we say uh, or if we recommend students to talk about a problem and to contact the teacher, well, the teacher, him or herself, should also be able to deal with the problem and should not only be able to refer to still another person. So that's also something that we really noticed in our uh, research. Um, yeah, here's some examples or here are some examples of uh, school-based uh, programs on cyberbullying. So you can see a, a German program called Medienhelden. There's also an Italian program. So at this time, there are already some really evidence-based interventions that could be used uh, in schools and that uh, also have an effect on uh, victimization and perpetration. And then, of course, and that's uh, an actor that you don't see, of course, in the case of traditional bullying. Another important actor is actually the industry. So, uh, for instance, the social media platforms themselves. So think about Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or WhatsApp. Um, and they should really be involved because the cyberbullying is taking place at their platforms. And I think they can do a lot. They can do a lot to prevent the cyberbullying, but also they can focus on detecting uh, the cyberbullying or making it possible for users to report instances of cyberbullying. And 
if something is detected and reported, they of course should also do something about it. They should not uh, let you report cyberbullying and then just uh, let it go by that. So uh, you should also have the feeling as a user that your problem is taken uh, care of. Um, so yeah, they can do a lot. Uh, per perhaps here also a few examples. Um, this is a research project in which we um, uh, collaborated with uh, people from other disciplines. Uh, and in this case, uh, these were uh, people specialized in computer ling linguistics. Um, and here we actually developed together with them, um, yeah, tools to automatically detect cyberbullying, but also other types of online harassment um, at the platforms themselves. So uh, we see, of course, that Facebook, Instagram, uh, they, they have to deal with a lot of information. There are a lot of posts they have to deal with. And of course, they don't, can't check everything uh, manually or they can't just rely on human moderators. So this is actually software then that uh, helps to detect uh, cyberbullying instances based also on artificial intelligence. Um, um, yeah, this is really yeah, technology that, that helps to make a first selection, that helps to detect whether something might be cyberbullying. And this can then be judged by human moderators. So this is what we collaborated on with uh, people, other people from the University of, uh, of Antwerp. So this is very useful then, the automatic detection of uh, cyberbullying. This is something else they could do. Uh, I think platforms can not only focus on how to prevent or deal with uh, the negative, they can also try to uh, create a more positive atmosphere. So the design of these platforms can also um, actually promote positive behavior. So here you can see an example of uh, how the design could actually uh, incite positive behavior. So here you can see that this is uh, an app that um, yeah, mentions, say something nice. So actually people are already nudged into saying something positive instead of something uh, negative, uh, for instance. Um, here you see another example. Uh, this is a study on Facebook. And this is again about the design of a platform. Um, and here it is about um, the possibility that you have on a, a platform to add uh, your emotions to your post. So you could indicate, for instance, on Facebook, how you're feeling. Are you feeling happy or how you, are you feeling sad? And uh, this study actually indicates that if you use these features that are provided by the platform, that that could actually be beneficial. So this study revealed that if people post something, post a certain message, but at the same time, they indicate how they are feeling. For instance, I'm feeling devastated or I'm feeling helpless or nervous or heartbroken. So adding this uh, emotion, emotion actually uh, increased the number of reactions, positive reactions, supportive reactions by uh, the followers or by the friends of this person. So you can already see that, yeah, how uh, a platform is designed, the type of features that it provides to the users can on the one hand facilitate positive behavior like here in this instance, but it can also, create indeed uh, negative or promote negative aspects. Uh, we've seen in the past that platforms that allow uh, uh, users to react anonymously, for instance, that these platforms are typically also used to cyberbully. Um, and then the last uh, actor, uh, the police, health professionals, uh, media can also be important. Uh, the police, of course, because they often have a more direct way 
towards um, the platform. So if it is very difficult for you as a user to uh, delete uh, certain posts, it might be uh, a good way, for instance, to contact the police, uh, especially if it's about, let's say, nude pictures that are being distributed on uh, so social networking sites, but because the police can indeed intervene uh, in a much easier way. Um, here you can also see that the police are sometimes also really uh, within a platform. Here you can see um, uh, a picture of a game uh, that was oftentimes played by young people. And in that game, there was also a police office. And actually there was a real police officer present in the game. And that also made sure that if there were any problems, young people could contact him or her, and then the situation could be solved. Um, of course, the media are also very important. Uh, as a communication scientist, I've also looked at that. And media can play a very important role because, of course, news media, for instance, are very important in creating awareness of the issue. Um, it's often the way adults uh, learn about uh, certain problems in society and it's also a way of instructing them what to do in case of cyberbullying. Um, so news media can be important. Um, we also notice in our country, for instance, that the channels of the public service broadcaster uh, that are developed for young people uh, also have their own, uh, let's say, week against bullying. And this is also a very uh, strong tool in creating awareness uh, about bullying and about cyberbullying in a certain uh, region. Here too, we see that there might also be some negative aspects related to news media and how they report on cyberbullying. This is also uh, the result of a study that we did on um, how newspapers reported on cyberbullying. And here you can see that indeed over time there was a sharp decrease, increase sorry, in uh, the number of articles that appeared on cyberbullying. So you could clearly see that it became an important topic and it put the topic also on the agenda of the general audience. But what you can also see is that much of the news attention is really focused on the most negative cases. So the cases of cyberbullying that are associated, for instance, with uh, the suicide of uh, the victim. So there were some very notorious international cases and you can see that they get a lot of attention. And actually that is a pity because it also kind of creates the idea that Cyberbullying always has very negative outcomes, and of course, that shouldn't uh, have to be the case. Conclusion, I'm sorry I, it took so long. <laughs> so you can see, I think, that cyberbullying is indeed a very complex uh, problem, uh, and indeed that we need a lot of uh, stakeholders to be able to uh, address that problem. Uh, so we really need a multi-stakeholder uh, approach. Uh, so uh, at this time, uh, we are still doing uh, research in this area. At this moment, we see that there is quite a lot of attention for specific types of cyberbullying, for instance, uh, bias-based cyberbullying. So are you being cyberbullied because you belong to a certain group, uh, because you have a certain gender or because you have uh, search certain sexual preferences or because you belong to a certain ethnic group, for instance. Uh, so that is a, a line of research that we are uh, interested in at this moment. We're also looking at uh, online hate speech, which is uh, closely related to bias-based cyberbullying because online hate speech is also often linked to people's belonging to a certain group. So hate speech can also be based uh, on uh, characteristics of 
like sexuality, people's uh, sexual preferences or uh, people's cultural backgrounds of uh, religions, backgrounds, etc. And here too, at this moment, we are looking at the role of bystanders. And again, can we promote positive bystandership? If we see a lot of online hate speech, for instance, on Twitter, how can we su support people in reacting um, in the right way? And here you can see that we're involved in a current European project called Detect. Uh, we again collaborate with computer linguistics, and here uh, this is a company which is actually a spin-off from the University of Antwerp. It's called TextGain. They are really specialized in detecting online hate speech, um, and they are actually also creating tools that can uh, support bystanders. So they don't only detect the online hate speech, but they also help bystanders in reacting. For instance, um, together with them, we have also created uh, a database of uh, memes um, uh, figuring cats. Uh, and bystanders can actually uh, use these memes to then react to online hate speech. And then the last thing that we are currently involved in is online celebrity bashing. So uh, celebrities, of course, uh, uh, are very visible also online. And we also see that they are easily attacked, not only by news media, but also by the general audience. Um, and yeah, I think that celebrity bashing is interesting to study because it also creates kind of a idea about what is normal behavior online or not. And if we treat famous persons in a bad way, and we think that's normal, that's something that we could also perhaps see then later on in a peer context where young people think, well, if we can call Rihanna, for instance, being fat, we can also do that uh, or say that about uh, one of our uh, fellow students, for instance. So that's more about how cultures are created, how media, uh, also create certain norms and how we can also learn from that in a negative way. Very famous example is perhaps also Trump, of course, who was not the right example on Twitter, who also almost seems like seemed like a cyber bullying himself. And you could also see that that influenced the general audience and how they reacted also online. And it, it also was clear in schools, uh, for instance, that that influenced uh, pupils in, for instance, how they were reacting towards certain uh, ethnic minorities. Okay, so now I'm really done. Uh, so I would like to thank you for uh, yeah, attending uh, the seminar. Uh, if you have any questions, you can, of course, uh, ask them here uh, right now, but you may also contact me later on through email, or you can also have a look at um, the website of our research group, because the research that I mentioned is, of course, not only my research, but we did this within a, a team with a lot of PhD and postdoc students. Um, so yeah, th that's also their work. Okay, so thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very informative presentation. Um, so do, do we have any questions? Uh, if yes, please feel free to unmute yourself and just go ahead. If you don't have a mic, you can post the question in chat. Well, I do have a question. Oh, I think we have a question. Uh, well, not a question, but a comment. I just wanted to thank you, and uh, it was a really great presentation. And I just don't have questions. I really feel inspired. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Uh... Hi, I've got a question. Okay, that 
again, yeah, as, as well, Heidi, I'd like to echo that sentiment. Thank you. Really interesting research there. And, and I think you explained the topic really clearly. Uh, my name is Gareth Court. I'm a, an online safety consultant for European Schoolnet based there in Brussels, mm -hmm. who uh, yeah. obviously do a lot of education work. You've probably heard of us. And we also run the, um, the InSafe network of uh, European safer internet centers across mm -hmm. the continent. Uh, we're, we're actually doing some work on cyberbullying. I just wanted uh -huh. to, to pick your brains around this concept of automatic detection of cyberbullying. And you talked about some of the tools uh -huh. in mm -hmm. your presentation, which I imagine mostly rely on, on things like keywords or, or certain expressions. Mm -hmm. With the rise of more visual based platforms in recent years you know you mentioned TikTok mm -hmm. extensively Snapchat mm -hmm. Instagram uh, you know YouTube as a, as a platform for communication as well do you mm -hmm. feel that those those kind of tools are becoming less effective now that we're moving to a more visual based way of communicating particularly for young people um, yeah, I do believe that indeed the visual aspects is very important nowadays in different platforms. Um, so I guess uh, indeed that we in we also need uh, uh, automatic detection actually of images and videos. And we were also collaborating in the project that I mentioned, uh, the Amica project, with people from the University of Leuven who were actually involved in uh, detecting harmful images. Uh, so in this case, it was, for instance, also focused on sexual images or nude images, but also uh, Im images of uh, mutilation. So I do think that we actually need um, both the analysis of text and the analysis of images um, and videos. Uh, and that the two will also be very complementary because oftentimes uh, you also see a combination of the two that you have a meme and you have certain text on it and the two actually uh, are necessary to be able to interpret it, um, the real uh, message. Um, but I, I also agree that it is actually quite difficult to automatically detect cyberbullying. Because indeed, if you just look at keywords, that that doesn't say that much. If you call somebody a whore, this doesn't mean that it is an insult. You, we also notice in our research, for instance, that even friends could call each other whore. And then it was perfectly normal. It was not cyberbullying at all. Uh, on the other hand, you also have cases of uh, cyberbullying that wouldn't be considered a cyberbullying at all by the, this automatic detection software. Uh, yeah, perhaps we should think back about the picture of the girls at the seaside. Looks like a very positive picture. You wouldn't think of, of cyberbullying, uh, not at all, actually. So that's why I think the automatic detection can be useful, but you will always need moderators, human moderators, who then have a closer look at the contents that are flagged as potential cases of cyberbullying. And also, I think we really need the reporting systems, because oftentimes you really need to be aware of the relationships between people, the, the, the offline context, actually, to be able to, to, to judge the situation. Um, so yeah, I do think that the technology can help, but yeah, we also have to nuance that. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, it looks like my colleague Veronica has got a hand up. Yeah. <laughs> hi, Veronica. Hi. Yeah, hi, Heidi. Thank you so much. It was really like a very good overview. And um, yeah, because you didn't spend so much time on, on you didn't have so much time to discuss uh, solutions and, and more concrete uh yeah approaches i was um i wanted to ask you if um you could go a bit deeper maybe more concrete for instance on what we could do um with uh, schools the level of schools and also especially with parents um mm -hmm. because i see many and we see it, i'm working with gareth another colleague who is also today mm -hmm. on a project and um yeah we, we usually find many blockers many problems at schools and uh, when they say, yeah, we don't know how to react, but many times we also feel sometimes there is interest, but not really, we don't have time, we don't have mm. the resources, we are not well trained. And in mm. the end, very little happens. And mm. then 
for parents, I, I understand your point, but do you think yeah, we should educate parents? How could we help? Do you think that would be enough to have materials made available, brochures, or hmm. should really other kind of approach be used with parents? Because usually also the responsibility goes to schools. Yeah. And we also see many times the schools complaining that we organize a parents evening, nobody came. Hmm. So I think like if you have some ideas or something that might work or could give us advice in which direction. Yeah, I think in, in Belgium, we indeed see that, that schools um, are often willing to do something about it. But indeed, you see a lot of barriers, like indeed teachers who are saying, we don't have the time, we don't have the expertise, we don't have the right support. Um, so that is really a serious problem actually for them. And I think that actually this also points to the role of policymakers because uh, policymakers can actually uh, almost ask students to pay attention to the problem and to make time uh, for addressing the problem also within the classroom. So I think in different countries, you, you have the requirements uh, that schools should uh, be able to present an anti-bullying or an anti-cyberbullying plan, uh, and that they are also evaluated on the quality of this, this program. This is not the case in Belgium, but I do think that policymakers could play an important role here and that they could ask, of course, of schools um, that they invest in this, but that they can also provide the right support and financial means to indeed install some of these evidence-based intervention programs. Because especially in the field of uh, traditional bullying, you can see that there are some um, programs like the Kiva program, the Finnish anti-bullying program, that, that are gradually being uh, yeah, kind of standard even in schools and that they do help in uh, yeah, addressing traditional bullying and to some extent also cyberbullying. Uh, so I think that policymakers really play also an important role and that they should, should actually demand more from schools and that they also should pay attention to the evaluation afterwards. Um, so with regard to schools, I think that is uh, an important issue. I think that many of these school-based uh, programs indeed also um, uh, request actually that there is a kind of whole school approach. So indeed, as a school, you should try to engage parents, uh, but I can really understand for schools that that is not always that uh, easy. Uh, perhaps it's easier when children are younger and when they go to school in a certain neighborhood um, and when parents are more, more, still more strongly involved. But once your children are also in secondary school and perhaps go to uh, another region, um, it becomes very difficult to get to get uh, parents on board, but at least they should try to to do uh, to to engage uh, to engage uh, parents. But apart from that, I do think that we could also reach out to parents uh, uh, via different ways, and and perhaps indeed news media also play an important role because because that's the way we are getting informed. And here too, I think that media play an important role because they really have a tendency to make cyberbullying also a very important issue. Uh, you can see that in the title is often um, uh, addressed as a very serious problem. It's also associated with uh, suicide, etc. So they created a kind of fear, but I think they should also put more emphasis on, on how to deal with this. And I think that yeah, this is an alternative way to, to reach perhaps uh, parents via the, the news media. But this, of course, also um, uh, demands that, that it's, yeah, what they present in the news media is, is adequate and the, that the suggestions that they do are, are also really evidence-based, let's say. Um, I also think that an alternative way that is also being mentioned uh, also in health communication research is 
like um, uh, entertainment education. So if you can't reach uh, parents through um, the schools because they're not involved that much or they're not interested in, in doing that, um, and if you can't reach them through news media, oftentimes an alternative route is uh, creating entertainment or putting messages in the media they're uh, consulting anyway. So for instance, in, in Flanders, our public uh, broadcaster um, has a very popular soap, which is uh, watched by a large uh, group of the population, more than a million viewers, and which is a large uh, group in our very small country. But even in these types of programs, even though it's fiction, you can see that some uh, themes or topics are, are yeah, uh, yeah, mentioned actually in, in the narratives. And it's actually a very good strategy to, to reach a good group, but also because we see that people often learn through narratives, through stories. Um, you can see that also now in the context of uh, COVID-19 and uh, vaccination, the strategies of anti-vaxxers is oftentimes using storage stories to, to say, oh, okay, this is a very bad situation and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't go do, do, get vaccinated. But you can also use stories in a very positive way and you can even model the right uh, behavior. Um, for instance, you could show a cyberbullying uh, instance and you sh could show also to parents and to students how they could or should react and what kind of strategies perhaps uh, are not really beneficial and what kind of strategies are very useful. We also had, have a, a program in Flanders that is aimed at young people and that is actually doing that. So um, it's a kind of television format and it's concentrated on, I think, four young people and um, it's a, it was a very popular program in, in Flanders, but the storylines were actually based on information that the scenario writers got from the helpline, Awel. So the helpline, Awel, is being contacted by young people about several types of issues, all the problems that they are experiencing. And it can range from being bullied or cyber bullied to yeah, having a conflict with uh, my parents or my parents are getting divorced, etc. So they were using all this information about what problems are young people experiencing. And these problems were then actually uh, integrated in this uh, fiction uh, program. So it was a serial, but it was very popular. And actually throughout this uh, program, uh, yeah, the audience really learned about, okay, other people are, are also experiencing this and they were also modeling them how young people could cope with that. So I do think that there are some alternatives also to reach parents, even if they are not involved or even if they are not interested. And what we also see is that once parents are, um, let's say, confronted with the problem, uh, if their child is involved, is if it is, if it is a perpetrator or a victim or a bystander, in that kind of uh, circumstances, they will actually try to find the right situation, uh, to do the right information. So in that case, they are triggered to look, for instance, for websites giving advice. And that's an opportunity then, I think, although it's perhaps a little bit too late then, but then it is also important to have the right guidelines, uh, for instance, on, on a website. Uh, and I do think that there are currently quite a lot of websites giving some kind of advice, but I also think, and that's again, uh, an issue that is also important, that it is important to have a dedicated space where you can find actually most expertise on how to how to deal with uh, cyberbullying, for instance, so that people also know where they should be to to get the best advice. Let's say. 
Oh, thank you so much, Hayley. It's super useful. And, and yeah, we, we appreciate like the ideas and uh, concrete also examples about the narrative. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we still have time for some question or uh, is it for fine with for you? Me? Yeah, for me, it's fine. Sure. So uh, are, are there other, other questions perhaps? Well, if that's okay, I, I had uh, one question. Um, if uh, I wanted to ask if you know if there are any, well, uh, country differences in levels or type of sorry cyberbullying any that any that could give like any indication of how how this problem might differ uh, when you look at different uh, well cultures basically and, uh, and countries i imagine mm -hmm. that much of the research is probably focused in particular regions but perhaps you yeah. have some I think perhaps even Veronica knows more about it than, than I myself. Uh, I do know indeed that there are large, there there are actually quite large um, uh, country differences. Uh, if you just look at, for instance, EU Kids Online studies, uh, you can indeed see that the prevalence rates are quite uh, different. Although the methodology that has been used in these countries is actually uh, the same. Um, but it's it often is very difficult to to really know what is uh, what are the the best explanations for these uh, these differences. Uh, I know indeed that some uh, of these studies have looked at, for instance, Hofstede's di dimensions. So, so what is typical for a culture? Um, how does a country score uh, on different uh, characteristics? But um, my my evaluation of that research is that it it's often very difficult to really say like okay this is now the the, the best explanation for a difference sometimes it's also related of course to um, yeah what is the degree uh, of ict use in a country uh, what kind of uh, uh, platforms are, are most popular in which region etc um, or what is the degree of traditional bullying? Because that's also a large predictor. But it's to my or that's my evaluation. It's not always that 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 easy to to really say like this is cause is causing also um, differences in cyberbullying culture. It could also be related to, for instance, like uh, legislation. In some countries, there's really, yeah, more strict reg regulation also with regard to cyberbullying. Um, but yeah, there, there might be very different uh, explanations. I, I don't really have a, a good view on what is most important uh, there to explain these differences. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I see some helpful links in the chat. So thank you very much for that as well. I'll definitely check on that. Um, okay, do, do we have any other questions? Well, if, if, if not, thank, okay, thank you. I'm saving all these links and I'll definitely <laughs> browse through that. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you for the presentation. I learned a lot. I think all of us can say that. And uh, yeah, I hope we'll keep meeting at further seminars. Next week, uh, we'll be talking about, well, Professor Laura Vandenbosch will be talking mostly uh, about the effects of media on body image among youth. And well, thank you again. This was really great. Uh, um yeah okay thank you. thank you very much uh thank you for giving me the opportunity to present here so and thank you all for your attendance and for the question questions so thanks